Tonight, Hunter Valley bride and groom join hundreds farewelling Queensland's Angus Craig, one of ten friends killed on their wedding day. The devastated dad blaming soft youth crime punishments for his son's death. How Queensland scientists are using bakery dust to detect COVID in large crowds. The grocery shopping trend saving families $200 a month. And how Barry the Brush Turkey's new home has Gold Coast City Council in a real flap. This is Nine News Queensland. Good evening. Tears and tributes today for Queensland engineer Angus Craig. Farewelled in the first funeral following the deaths of 10 people in the Hunter Valley bus disaster. His partner survived the crash and was there to honour his memory, along with the couple whose wedding they'd been celebrating before the tragedy. For newlyweds Mitchell and Maddie Gaffney, the most tragic of lows in an emotional roller coaster ride. Just over two weeks ago, they were celebrating their nuptials with good friend Angus Craig. Today, they're amongst mourners, farewelling the 28 year old at a funeral service at the Shoalhaven Memorial Gardens. A kite ward near his coffin and a slideshow of his life. Somebody call out to your brother, he's calling out your name. A kind hearted adventurer and a soon to be uncle. How cruel is this loss? A lovely, well-mannered, gorgeous boy. Angus leaves behind a sister, a mother and father, and a lifelong friend. As a kid, I hated when you went away on holidays without me. I would always miss you, but I would love when you returned. You have now gone on one final holiday from which you won't be returning. The young mechanical engineer was on the bus that night in the Hunter Valley, one of ten wedding guests who didn't make it home. His girlfriend, Bella Liddy, survived the crash. It breaks my heart that our time was cut too short. I will know that I am forever a better person for having loved and been loved by you, Angus. On Wednesday, many of these mourners will be in Singleton to farewell the young doctor, Beck Mullen. Then over coming weeks, there'll be more funerals in Sydney, Tasmania and Melbourne. The grief from this tragedy knows no boundaries. Can we please all stand for a moment of reflection? And at today's service, they remembered all the victims from that fateful night. The brave young couple who brought them all together today showed extraordinary strength and they'll need it as they face the next funeral, leaving a friend's grieving sister to say one last goodbye. He is with us in the evening when we say goodnight to him and he is with us when we tell him that we love him. Damien Ryan, Nine News. A toddler has been hit and killed by a car in a driveway north of Brisbane. Live to Peter Fegan in the newsroom. Uh, Peter, always sounds like dreadful circumstances. What more can you tell us? Andrew, this is most certainly so difficult to comprehend, but at 10.16 this morning, paramedics were called to an address at George Street in Bald Hills of reports of a one-year-old boy suffering from head injuries. Unfortunately, I can report tonight, Andrew, that this little boy was playing on the driveway of the home. He was hit by the family car that was sadly being driven by his father. I can also report that both uh, the mother and father of this little boy were in the the back of the ambulance as he was rushed to Redcliffe Hospital. Unfortunately, Melissa, he died of his injuries. I can also report the police are investigating, are currently trying to get to the bottom of what has happened. No charges have been laid and they will now prepare a report for the coroner. Melissa? Peter, thanks for the update. Tragedy 2 on the Sunshine Coast where a rising young football star has been hit and killed while walking home. Tonight, the woman behind the wheel is being questioned by police. 16-year-old Benjamin Hunter, a young star for the Nambour Crushers. Go, DJ! Go! But last night, his bright future was tragically cut short. The teenager killed after being hit by a car while walking along Image Flat Road just before midnight. Upon arrival, we were confronted with a 16-year-old male who had significant chest and head trauma. Devastated friends returning to the scene today, laying flowers and even a rugby league ball in memory of the one they affectionately called BJ. His mum penning a heartfelt message saying, I'm so proud of you. Your heart is as big as your smile. Love you forever, mum. Just really lost for words, I suppose. Absolutely devastating. An unwavering Bronco supporter from a young age, BJ emulated his idols with ball in hand, a member of the Sunshine Coast Falcons and Melbourne Storm Academy. The 24-year-old woman behind the wheel of the car has been interviewed by the Forensic Crash Unit. At this stage, no charges have been laid. 
yeah, it's one, one big family at the Crushers and we'll certainly be getting behind um, the Hunter family at this time, that's for sure. In Nambour, Cam Inglis, Nine News. To breaking news now, and police have charged three young offenders over a string of armed robberies involving Facebook Marketplace. Straight to Tim Arvia, who has exclusive details at Brisbane Magistrates Court. Tim, what are your sources telling you about this case? Well, Andrew, police believe this is related to the African crime gang, the Squish-bound Gorillas, who they believe are recruiting teenagers to carry out crime across Ipswich and Logan. Today they charged two 15-year-olds and a 17-year-old with 31 offences relating to crimes allegedly carried out in relation to Facebook Marketplace. They say these teenagers met up with people online who were selling mobile phones or other Apple products, met up with them and then robbed them with, at knife point. Now, these three teens face court today, but under state law, journalists are locked out of courtrooms involving juvenile matters, so we were unable to bring you exactly what happened in court. What we can tell you, though, is the state government's own figures are painting a worrying picture in terms of repeat youth offenders. Nine News can reveal in 2020 there were just over 500 serious repeat juvenile offenders, according to the government. By 2022, that number now rising to 660. There are no stats out for this year, Andrew, but as you can see, the trend is going in one direction. Thanks, Tim. Four men have been rushed to hospital suffering burns after an explosion at the Bundaberg Brew Drinks factory. It's understood the men were installing a boiler when there was an explosion. All four are in a serious but stable condition in hospital. WorkCover says it's now investigating the incident. Overseas now, and the US Secretary of State believes cracks are starting to show in Vladimir Putin's rule over Russia after his one-time ally led an armed rebellion against him. Anthony Blinken says while the unrest was short-lived, the fact it occurred at all is extraordinary. A return to relative normality in Russia, 24 hours after Moscow was bracing for a rapidly advancing armed rebellion. In the south, Wagner forces going, but leaving their mark where they'd claimed control of military headquarters. It was scary and it ended sort of suddenly, this man says. In an interview airing on Russian state TV today, Vladimir Putin didn't directly acknowledge the biggest ever threat to his leadership. Recently, I've been going to bed late, but I'm always in touch, he said, when questioned about his workload. But it's unclear when it was recorded. Wagner's march to Moscow was unexpectedly halted by its leader, Yevgeny Prigozhin, under a secret deal brokered by the Belarusian president. Prigozhin, now believed to be in exile in Belarus, it's been revealed US spy agencies picked up intelligence on the astonishing internal revolt against the Kremlin earlier this month. This is clearly, uh, we see cracks uh, emerging. Where they go, if, if, if anywhere, uh, wh when they get there, very hard to say. I don't want to speculate on it. Uh, but I don't think we've seen the final act. Key questions remain about the deal and what happens to the Wagner Group. What happens to Prigozhin's forces? Uh, do they remain in, uh, in Ukraine? A former British Army chief warning Prigozhin may still command his loyal troops. There is a possible threat that they might pose from Belarus to Kyiv. And if I was the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, I would watch that front very carefully. Volodymyr Zelensky tweeting, he's spoken with the US president about the weekend's events and discussed further defence support with an emphasis on long-range weapons. In London, Edward Godfrey, Nine News. And there's been a development in the bizarre standoff between Russia and Australia in Canberra, where a Russian diplomat has been squatting. Fiona Willen has the very latest. This rather eventful episode has now come to an end. A Russian diplomat who spent days squatting on land next to Parliament House, where Moscow wanted to build an embassy, has now vacated the site after the High Court rejected a bid by Russia to hang on to the land. The legal action was launched after Parliament rushed through laws to cancel the lease for the site due to national security concerns. The Prime Minister welcomed the court outcome this afternoon while pledging an extra $110 million in military support for Ukraine, as the focus also turned to the finances of Australians in need.
Kayla Kamaji has a new mouth to feed. She's eating food now, so that's more expensive as well. While she's on maternity leave, her family's relying on her husband's full-time income, which no longer stretches as far due to inflation. I'm more strict and I have to really budget and, you know, you're always stressing about money. It's even more stressful for those on the minimum wage, with new modelling revealing the extent of the problem. This is not a good situation. It's not one that should be happening in a country like Australia. Anglicare's first cost of living index shows a full-time minimum wage worker has just $57 left after covering weekly expenses such as rent, food, transport and childcare. A family of four with two full-time minimum wage workers has just $73 remaining each week. And single parents on the minimum wage can't even afford the essentials. Alarmingly, when we look at a single parent with one child, they are going backward by $180 each and every week. The report shows housing has taken the biggest hit to household budgets, with rents increasing by 30% since 2020. There are an increasing number of Australian families who just can't afford to pay their rent or pay their mortgage. The government says cost of living relief is on the way with a range of measures kicking in next month, including cheaper childcare for 1.2 million families. With subsidies climbing from July 10, a family on $120,000 with one child in care three days a week will be $1,900 a year better off or more than 3,300 if their earnings reach $180,000. On that same income, with one child in daycare and one in after-school care, they would save more than $4,000 a year. Childcare is expensive. It's gone up by about 49% in the last 10 years. That's why this is so important. Fiona Willen, Nine News. A woman is in hospital and a man is in police custody after a terrifying incident on the M1. Tyra Stowers joins us live from Surfers Paradise. Tyra, what happened? Well, a woman in her 20s is tonight recovering in a stable condition at the Gold Coast University Hospital, Andrew, after she has allegedly been thrown from a van on the M1 at around 9.30 last night. Now, police say that her and a man known to her were travelling northbound on the, M on the Pacific Motorway when it's parked near exit 49 in Pimpama on the northern end of the Gold Coast. This is when the woman was allegedly pushed from the van by a 21-year-old Shayla Parkman. She's then hit her head on the concrete barrier next to the road and she was transported to the Gold Coast University Hospital in a critical condition. Now the man, he's then driven off before returning a short time later and surrendering himself to police. She has now suffered some quite substantial injuries as a, as a result and the woman is being provided with treatment at the hospital. Now that 21-year-old man, he's been charged with multiple offences including grievous bodily harm, assault and driving whilst disqualified. Now he did face court this morning but his case has been adjourned until early next month, Andrew. Thanks Tyra. Former Labor leader Simon Crean is tonight being remembered by all sides of politics for his lasting legacy in Australia's halls of power. The former opposition leader has died suddenly in Germany at the age of 74. A giant of the Labor Party remembered for kindness and decency. This news came as a great shock and the entire Labor movement is saddened. 74-year-old Simon Crean was in Berlin with his wife Carol as part of an industry delegation when he collapsed on a morning walk on Sunday. The Crean family saying Simon saw life through empathy. He never needed acknowledgement for the things he achieved. He was humble, charismatic and loved by so many. We all have our ups and downs in politics. Simon Crean always looked forward. Simon Crean was elected to federal parliament representing the Melbourne seat of Hotham in 1990, going on to serve as a cabinet minister in four Labor governments and a stint as opposition leader. A Labor Party elder who famously called on Julia Gillard for a leadership spill in 2013. I am asking her to call a spill of all leadership positions. But he's perhaps best remembered for making the decision to oppose the war in Iraq, explaining why to the then US President George W. Bush. On occasions friends do disagree, as we did on this side, with you on the war in Iraq. 
A staunch unionist, Simon Crean was the son of Whitlam Government Treasurer Frank and served as ACTU president in the 1980s. This was a man that cared about people, cared about fairness, cared about justice. He's been a legend of the Labor Party, contributed his whole life to working people. Former Prime Ministers offering condolences from Julia Gillard. He hated injustice and fought hard to bring opportunity to all. Kevin Rudd saying, we're all the poorer for Simon's passing. We have lost a truly great Australian. And from political foe John Howard, he was a formidable adversary who I both liked and respected. He was a very decent human being, a very honourable person. You could shake hands with Simon and you knew that he would honour his word. The Prime Minister confirmed Simon Crean will be given a state funeral, but details about when and where it will be held will be released in coming weeks. Dougal Beatty, Nine News. The mother of the teenager on board the Titan sub has told how her son planned to break a world record while deep underwater. Tonight, a key piece of evidence is within reach. Like an aircraft's black box, the mothership carries an audio recorder, which could reveal what happened. We lost calm. I think that would be a sentence I would never want to hear in my life again. Moments before they stepped on board the Titan submersible, Christine DeWood hugged her husband and her son goodbye, not knowing they would never return. But I really, really miss them. 19-year-old Suleiman was one of five people on board the vessel. He'd packed his Rubik's Cube. He was planning to break a world record. Nine seconds, yeah? Yeah, but that's my best. He said, I'm going to solve the Rubik's Cube below sea at the Titanic. And he was so excited about this. One week on, there's now a deep sea search for answers. And it's this robot that's been scouring the ocean floor. Remotely operated, the Asidius 6000 has now completed four descents, almost four kilometres deep. The MBI is currently in its initial evidence collection phase, including debris salvage, salvage operations at the incident site. North of the border, the Titan's mothership pulled back into port in Canada, where authorities were waiting for a key piece of their investigation. Vessels of this size are required to have a, uh, a voyage data recorder, which records audio uh, that's on the bridge. Those audio recordings, another piece of the puzzle as to what went wrong when the Titan lost contact. We always answer the call. And so the ocean remains an unforgiving environment. Oceangate itself is contending with more than just multiple investigations. The company facing the very real prospect of lawsuits from the families of those involved. Tonight, as the search for answers rolls on, Oceangate's headquarters have been shut down indefinitely. In the United States, Lauren Tamazi, Nine News. Tracked down. Watch as a Queensland police dog sniffs out a mammoth haul. The brush turkey stouch that has a Gold Coast neighbourhood in a flap. Troubled waters off our coast for these unlucky boaties. And Aussies owed $400 million in flight credits at the end of sport. How to get your refund. Four boaties have been pulled to safety, rescued from their sinking tinny on the Burham River near Harvey Bay. A fisherman nearby responding to the emergency call around 9.45 this morning. Water police arriving a short time later, rescuing the group before their boat fully submerged. Everyone's safe and well. Is there anyone that requires medical attention at all, like see an ambulance officer or anything? No? Police are urging anyone planning to head out on the water these school holidays to stay vigilant and wear the appropriate safety equipment. Police have raided a home in Mount Isa, uncovering drugs, cash, watches and gel blasters. Police dog Hope leading detectives to items hidden throughout the property. The 38-year-old man arrested at the address was refused bail and is facing a string of drugs charges. A brush turkey bachelor is ruffling feathers on the Gold Coast after building his nest on a council water meter. Hoping to attract a mate, he's instead started a minor stoush between one resident and council. It might look like a mess to the untrained eye, but this is actually a carefully created nest. A burly head's bachelor pad for a bird looking for love. Scratching in the 
nature strips and throwing all the dirt onto the road. The architect is known around Kingia Court as Barry, the neighbourhood brush turkey. What, what do you do with them there, you know, birds, wild animals? If it's causing a nuisance around here, then I think the council should, um, you know, take notice of it. They have, because Barry's built his nest right on top of a water meter, and when council workers couldn't access it, they told the unlucky property owners they'll be fined if the mess isn't cleaned up. Trouble is, under Queensland law, it's actually illegal to remove a brush turkey's nest, meaning evicting Barry could cost residents a minimum $667 fine or even a year in jail. To break the stalemate, Gold Coast Council now tells us it will hire experts to relocate the brush turkey, but not for at least a couple of months until mating season is over. And it may keep growing in the meantime. A huge mound is the sign of a, a loser male, unfortunately for them. For now, meter readers will simply estimate the property's water usage. As for why council had a sudden change of heart, it turns out Barry has friends in high places. Barry the bush turkey, leave Barry alone until he finish what the hell he's doing there. Jessica Warboys, Nine News. A climate protester who blocked one of Brisbane's busiest motorways leading to the Port of Brisbane has just walked free from the watch house. Jessica Millwood joins us live. Jess, you've spoken with him. Even an evening, Andrew. I have Dash Ross Borsbeck walked from the watch house a short time ago. He has spent the past six days in custody. It was last Tuesday that he's accused of climbing up a man-made tripod, live streaming that protest that shut down the Port of Brisbane motorway, one of several protests that took place last week from the group Blockade Australia. His supporters waited outside the watch house all day and greeted him with cheers, Dash apologising to those motorists that he encountered convenience. I'm sorry that they were stuck in traffic. It's not something that I do in a, in a, in a world that wasn't facing this problem. The 59-year-old father of two does face strict bail conditions after his bail was granted in the Supreme Court this morning. He must report to police once weekly and he cannot participate in any unlawful protest activity. His supporters, well, Andrew, they remain here at the Watch House tonight. Thanks, Jess. Supermarket savings. Tonight, the new shopping trend slashing southeast grocery bills by hundreds of dollars a month. We show you how it works. Our special consumer report is ahead. He begged to have his son locked up. Next, a devastated southeast father calling for tougher action against our teenage criminals. A major outage blocks Queenslanders from accessing their cash. The popular baking product detecting COVID-19. Plus why this shot put athlete is competing in the hurdles. A Brackenridge mother and father have made a desperate plea for tougher sentencing on the 20th anniversary of their troubled son's death. Dane Berg was killed in 2003 when the stolen car he was driving crashed. Today marks 20 years since Katrina and Ashley Berg lost their youngest son, Dane. Car accident, um, later found out 180 k's an hour, stolen car. He was only 22. Did the judicial system fail your son? As far as I'm concerned, the judicial system killed my son. Dane was adopted by the Bergs from New Zealand when he was just a day old. From that day on, um, he was ours, as far as we were concerned. Brought up in a loving home in Bracken Ridge with his three older brothers. He was mischievous, just like everybody else, but he was never naughty. But trouble came knocking when Dane was 13. Started off with cigarettes and that progressed into marijuana. And marijuana progressed into the heavier stuff. The offending becoming more violent. It was vicious assault. Always somebody smaller than him older than him, someone that couldn't hurt him. Dane was brought before this court 27 times by the time he was 16, before he was finally sent to jail. But that's only because his dad, Ashley, interrupted the court and begged the magistrate to lock him up. I told the magistrate to get his finger out of his 
and actually do something for the community who are supposed to be protecting the community. But Dane was out of jail and back on the streets in just a matter of weeks. And for the next five years, the in and out of prison yo-yo continued until he died in that last stolen car. What's changed in 20 years? Nothing. Absolutely bloody nothing. Nothing's changed. In fact, I think of anything it's got worse. Blaming the courts for being too soft on our teenage crims. Got locked up for stealing a car, out on bail, stole another one. Their message to magistrates. Get off your a** and do something. I wish that they would listen to parents and let us parents go on a forum or start a forum or do something. Dane did want to change. He just never got the chance to, writing letters to his mum from Woodford Prison just months before he died. How are you supposed to feel when you're caught between treachery and friendships, judgment and freedom? Is there really a brighter day ahead for me? Emily Prang, Nine News. Customers at Australia's biggest bank spent most of today unable to access their money. As finance editor Chris Collar tells us, the outage left many furious. The outage started first thing this morning. With multiple services down, Australia's biggest bank was brought to its knees and customer phone lines were immediately swamped. We currently have a technical problem with telephone banking and net bank, which will prevent you from transferring money and paying bills. You may wish to call back later, as we're experiencing a high number of calls. Cards were declined at supermarkets and cafes. No groceries for me today, apparently, tweeted one customer. Others panicked as accounts showed balances of zero dollars. More than a few called for compensation from their bank, while this user said his boss hasn't been able to pay any staff. The official statement came from CBA. We're aware some customers are experiencing difficulties accessing some of our services and we are urgently investigating. We apologise and thank customers for their patience. Later adding branch staff will not have any further information. This is the kind of thing that impacts digital payments and the digital economy. If people can't rely on their tap and go, their app and the digital payment system, then we will have to revert to carrying around a spare bit of cash with us everywhere we go. That seems unlikely. 7.7 .7 million people use Commonwealth Bank's app. The vast majority of transactions are now digital. But today that scale just showed the impact that a bug in the system can have. Chris Kohler, Nine News. Saving her team from losing crucial competition points, a Belgian shot putter has stepped in to replace an injured teammate in the 100 metres hurdles. Though she finished last, she won the praise of her opponents at the European Athletics Team Championships. A surprising Queensland discovery next the popular baking product detecting COVID-19. The new shopping trend slashing hundreds of dollars off Southeast grocery bills. And what a performer, Elton John goes out in spectacular style. To Money Matters and the share market has finished lower for a fourth consecutive day. The ASX started the new week the same way it finished the last one, down. Most major miners were lower, except for gold miners, and Telstra has now backed away from those multi-year highs. Shareholders shrugged off a major outage for Commonwealth Bank customers, only minor losses there, as the stock drifts further below $100. And Tasmanian whisky distillery Lark had a shocking day, down 16%, as it warns of a sharp drop in sales. The Australian dollar is buying less than 67 US cents, 61 euros cents and 52 British pence. Checking the fuel prices, the average for unleaded in Brisbane $1.76, diesel $1.83 and on the Gold Coast the average for unleaded $1.75. You'd normally associate yeast with Vegemite, beer or bread, but Queensland researchers have found a way to use it to detect COVID-19. The sensor dust is being billed as a cheap and accessible tool to safeguard communities from future pandemics.
It's one of the most common ingredients on the planet. Now, baker's yeast can be used to detect viral threats. The garden variety of yeast uh, is programmed to make wine or beer or bread. Our yeast is programmed to sense and report viruses. University of Queensland researchers creating powdery nanoprobes or a sensor dust from yeast fragments to be deployed at places like stadiums, airports and train stations potentially sprinkled on the ground or sprayed into the air with futuristic technology to capture live data of any viruses it comes into contact with. Really cheap and really easy to make that could be cheaply deployed in the developing world. It can be genetically programmed to detect any future strains and give health systems a heads up on new or emerging viruses. We were making this uh, yeast-based technology for a lot of other cancer detection, other bacteria, and then COVID came along. The next step for researchers here at UQ, developing a system for detecting the virus remotely without needing any specialist equipment. So that it could be detected by a remote sensor, a security camera, iPhone, satellite or drone. With an ultimate goal of using the dust to report emerging threats and transmission in real time, stopping future pandemics before they happen. Claire Todd Hunter, Nine News. Elton John has taken to the stage for his final UK show ever, playing to a crowd of an estimated 120,000 at the Glastonbury Festival. Some fans waited 17 hours for a spot to see the 76-year-old perform his greatest hits. During the concert, he thanked fans for 52 years of amazing love and loyalty. Fresh details on Ben Hunt's planned move to the Broncos. Plus, Rhys Walsh forced to front the NRL judiciary over a foul-mouthed rant that could rule him out of origin. Aussies owed $400 million in flight credits at the end of sport. How to get your refund? And it was warm westerly winds that pushed temperatures into the high 20s for a few suburbs today. Still 20 degrees here in the city, but I can assure you it'll be a chilly start to your Tuesday. Good evening. Reese Walsh will front the NRL judiciary tomorrow night to defend himself against accusations of abusing a referee with a foul-mouthed tirade. A case that has origin implications for Queensland because if the Broncos' fullback is found guilty, he's likely to be unavailable for Origin 3. As the NRL kicked off, beanies for brain cancer. Get up for. Both teams will be up for it. Um, you know, we just got to make sure we turn up with the right attitude this week. And if we do that, we get ourselves the best chance winning possible. Adam Jackson, Nine News. A blow for the Broncos and Titans with Ben Hunt staying put for now. After the Dragons rejected his request for an early release, Michael Chamis joins us ahead of 100% footy tonight. Michael, tell us, how did this all unfold? Yeah, Jono, another dramatic day for the Dragons. While the team, they trained in Wollongong this morning, Ben Hunt, he was nowhere to be seen. He was off meeting with club power brokers about that request for a release from his contract. Now, Nine News understands that Ben Hunt went into the meeting and said he did not want to leave the club immediately, despite reports linking him to the Brisbane Broncos on a mid-season transfer. Now, the Dragons, they've uh, denied that request. They want Hunt to give the club time to show him the way out of this club's dire predicament. But for now, he remains a dragon. Michael Chamis, live for us in Sydney tonight. Thank you. Queenslander Manus Lavashain insists he's not Stuart Broad's bunny and has already found a solution to handling the English paceman. Broad dismissed Lavashain cheaply in both innings at Edgebaston and the Aussie number three is determined to make amends at Lords. Australia arriving at Lords for its first session ahead of the second test, greeted by one of our all-time greats. Ricky Ponting with some valuable advice for the Aussies, including Marnus Lavishane, who's being driven by disappointments after Edgebaston. They're very uncharacteristic, um, both of those dismissals, to, to how I've usually played. So. That's why I was pretty frustrated with myself. Stuart Broad got him twice in the opening test. English press believe he has the Aussies number. Prior to this series, um, 
I don't think I'd been dismissed by Stuart Broad. So again, working closely with coach Andrew McDonald today, Labuschagne is confident he won't make the same mistakes again. I had to go away and, and, and probably ask myself the question: Well, why did I play at those deliveries? Um, and and sort of I've come up with my own summation of, of why that is. Are you able to tell us why you think you did? Um, not completely. I, I, I can't, give, can't give him everything. Four years ago, at this ground, Labuschagne became international cricket's first concussion substitute, starting his meteoric rise to the top of the game. Lord's holding a special place in his career. I did walk through the long room then, just before as we were coming down to the nets, and sort of brought back a few memories. I was thinking to myself, walking through there last time, no one knew who, no one knew I was, and no one. You know, People were sort of giving me a quiet clap just because it was like they were expecting Steve to walk through. <laughs> In London, Sam Jordan, Nine News. The Wallabies have had their first training session on the Gold Coast ahead of the Rugby Championship. It will be an intense week of training at Sanctuary Cove under the watchful eyes of Eddie Jones before a Friday morning flight to South Africa to take on the Springboks in the first test. After a batting collapse, Ashley Gardner put Australia in the box seat heading into the final day of the Women's Ashes Test. The off-spinner took three wickets in three overs to leave England at five for 116 at stumps on day four. You want to take wicket-taking balls every single ball, but um, on a wicket like this, it just doesn't happen. So you just need to stay patient, you need to keep the stumps in play, and it will happen. Australia will be hoping for more of the same from Gardner when play resumes tonight. England needs 152 runs to deny the Aussies victory. 15 wickets fell on day four. We only need five more tonight, so it should be OK. It shouldn't be too late at night. Live coverage on 9 Gem starts just before 8 o'clock. Nice one, yeah. thank you. Well, Qantas is urging customers to use their outstanding COVID-19 flight credits or cash them in before they expire. Here's Eddie Meyer with what you should do. Australia's biggest airline has been trying to clear a massive backlog of credits handed to customers when $2 billion worth of flights were cancelled during the pandemic. There's still $400 million in credits outstanding. So Qantas wants you to either use the credits for new flights or get a refund before they expire at the end of this year. The airline has been criticised for poor customer service but says it's made a number of changes to its booking systems to make the process easier. Airlines around the world have been facing up to this very same issue because the computer systems that power airline booking engines were never designed to handle a situation like this. So it's taken a while for things to get in sync and become easier for people to claim those travel credits. Right now Qantas knows it needs every customer on side as much as they can be and this is an important part of winning back customer goodwill. So what do you do? Well, if you book a flight using COVID-19 credits before July 31, there's an incentive, double frequent flyer points. The credits can be used for trips between now and December 2024, but you must make the booking by December 31 this year, or you can just ask for a refund. Qantas also has added a Find My Credit tool to its website to make it easier, although if you booked through a travel agent, you'll need to contact them. In just three minutes, the new shopping trend slashing hundreds of dollars off southeast grocery bills. We show you how to cash in. Our special report is moments away. First, though, Gary's back with a quick check on the weather. Gaz, we have enjoyed some lovely warm days. Oh, Melissa, we've certainly been feeling the heat here in southeast Queensland, while further south, sub zero temperatures and snow for the Alps. Some of that dry and cool air is pushing into our backyard, and that's why we're in for a chilly start to your Tuesday. Nearly three quarters of Australians have swapped popular brand name items to generic brand products as households grapple with the cost of living crunch. While we're used to seeing home brand options for our essentials, experts say there are more savings to be had if you're willing to make the switch. For pensioner Joan Kane, lots of things aren't as they used to be, including her weekly grocery shop. Probably twice as much as what it was a couple of years ago. This cost $143. To cut costs, she opts for generic brands where she can. I bought the home brand. It's, it's about $4 every dollar counts in my pocket. New research from Compare the Market revealing the majority of Australian households are swapping out big brands at the checkout. Things like milk, 
bread, pantry staples. Compare the market, put 15 popular grocery items under the microscope, including pasta, tea bags, cheese and bread. Comparing the price of name brands bought at Woolworths with their home brand equivalents. The results, significant. The generics basket working out to half the price of the brand products. $53 compared to $103. When you add that up over a month, it's over $200 in savings. For example, home brand olive oil is $9 cheaper. Switch to generic free-range eggs to save $2. Of all the products, tea, coffee, cereal and confectionery are the least likely to be swapped out. Customers willing to pay extra for the brands they know and love, but they're missing out on some of the biggest savings. Tea bags, roughly $6 cheaper when buying generic brands. A bulk packet of lollies, $7 cheaper. If you are willing to, to make that switch, there are savings. Still, Joan says she's willing to spend a few extra dollars on life's little luxuries. I can see you got your crumpets, though. It's a little, a little treat. As a treat. As a treat. Olivana Lathuris, Nine News. Yeah, you've got to have a treat. Well, time now for your full weather forecast. Back to Gary Youngbury. Gaz, are we in for another burst of cold weather? Oh, Andrew, it'll feel that way tomorrow morning. Some dry and fresh southwesterly winds tomorrow morning. We're looking at single digit temperatures even here in the city, even some frost patches in the southern interior. But a blue sky day, and although the daytime temperatures will be a bit cooler than what we've had the past few days, it'll still be slightly up on average. But our days are going to get a little bit cooler every day towards the end of the week. But what a day today on the coastline. Take a look at the Humpback Highway. This was off Burley today with those westerly winds just super clean conditions and perfect for whale watching if you want to catch a glimpse over the next few days just head down to your favorite beach or better still the headlands there is so many whales as they continue their migration further north and weather conditions will be ideal now let's take a look at temperatures recorded across southeast queensland and today warm again high 20s courtesy of those westerly winds the strongest wind gust brisbane airport at 56 kilometres per hour, but 29 degrees today at Tewantan on the Sunshine Coast, 27 in Maroochydore and Coolangatta, 26 in Redcliffe, the Gold Coast, Bow Desert and Caboolture, and a lot of the suburbs hit 25 today. The weather map, a band of rain and thunderstorms will stretch from the northwest of Western Australia through central Oz and into Victoria, showers over Tassie from an approaching cold front, while Queensland staying fine under the influence of a high pressure system. In a state for the capital shower or two Adelaide, Melbourne and Hobart, cloudy in Canberra, rain on the way for Alice Springs, sunny in Perth and Darwin expecting 32 degrees. Queensland, partly cloudy, high 20s for Cairns and Townsville, sunny 26 for Mackay, rocky 29, Gympie and Maryborough 25 degrees, sunny and very warm inland, low 30s in Mount Isa and Longreach, a cool morning in Roma getting down to 3 degrees overnight. Here in the southeast, a cold morning, early frost patches in the south but a sunny blue sky day, temperature reaching low 20s, west southwesterly winds up to 25 kilometres per hour in the morning. They will ease during the day. A max of 23 forecast for Ipswich, 21 on the coast and bay side. Moreton Bay, southwesterlies 15 to 20 knots, easing during the day. The sea's up to a metre and a half offshore at first. Brisbane, sunny, fresh west southwesters, a low of 9, a high of 22. Seven day outlook, cloudy Wednesday and 24, Thursday 23, Friday 22, cloudy Saturday and 21. The chance of showers developing Sunday with some possible rain early next week. Ipswich, Wednesday the warmest day, 25, back into the low 20s for the week. Cold mornings over the weekend, slight chance of a shower Sunday. For the Goldie, mostly fine days for the week, low 20s, light winds, Sunday starting out fine but showers developing. And on the Sunshine Coast, Wednesday fine and 25, Thursday 23, Friday 21, a little cloud on Saturday but Sunday the chance of even a little bit of rain developing later in the day and we could see some more rain as we move into early next week a possible rainfall event developing over central Queensland and the central coast of our state could be some heavy falls we'll keep an eye on that guys over the next few days nice one thanks thanks Gary and that's nine news Queensland for this evening Ali Langdon is next with the current affair thanks for your company good night